Everyone, this is your talking newspaper edition 1875 for Saturday the 2nd of March. Can't believe that, can you? Uh, I'm here, Buddy's here, <coughs> Charlie's here. Hello. And without any further ado, we are now introducing Mr. Charlie for me with the March birthdays. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Hello, everyone. Uh, right. Uh, this is the March birthdays. Um, the first one comes up on the 5th of March. We say a very happy birthday to John Boyle. On the 9th, we have Jeanette Scott. She was a film star, wasn't she? Um, very happy birthday to you, Jeanette, and, uh, for the 9th. On the 16th, we've got two. We've got Doug Dolly Higgins and Eddie Taylor. And I hope they're going to have a dance around the... Um, Dance around the concourse at the at the um, at the St George's Hall. But anyway, even if they don't, very happy birthday to you both. Uh, on the twenty first of um, March, we've got Thora Makin. Thora Makin is twenty one years old, I believe, and uh, she's looking good. And all the best to you, Thora. On the twenty third of March, it's Brian Hughes. Brian, as is. Is, is doing very well and have a really nice time for, for your birthday on the 23rd. Brian, and on the 30th, we've got another two. We've got a Mr. M. Nixon. Here's to you, Mr. Nixon, and Eileen Powell. A uh, very happy birthday to you, Eileen. Happy birthday to you both, and that's, that's the birthdays for March. So uh, I'll hand you back now to Steve, who's going to tell you all about... Um, Yes. All about, well, he'll tell you what he's going to tell you about. So I, I, I'm perhaps jumping the guns. No, no, you're not. Now then, everyone, for a start, um, <coughs> I asked my Google this morning who the first person to be named, who we can actually put a name to in history. And the answer it gave was Nama, who was the first pharaoh in the first of the 30 dynasties of kings that Egypt had. However, I can tell Google that it might be wrong because some pottery has been found at Abydos, ancient Egyptian city, which has a name which probably predates uh, Mr. Nama uh, to a dynasty before Egypt was united. Because before it was Egypt, there was an upper Egypt and a lower. Obviously yeah. divided by the Nile. Now, you'll find out in a few minutes why I'm telling you this. And you'll be thinking, well, what's that got to do with anything? Well, it has in a minute when I get there. <coughs> but first, it's reminded me to tell you of a story about these Egyptian kings. A few years ago, I was helping a, as a drama event for people with disabilities. And at the beginning, we were chatting and they were asking me what I did. And I said I did my history stuff, you know, usual stuff. And I said, if you really get bored, I'll give you all the American presidents from George Washington to today. So Martin, one of the young fellas there, he said, oh yeah. He said, I can do that. I said, right, old Martin. And I'd misjudged Martin because he sounded as though he had, you know, he had some difficulties. So we started. And guess what? Martin won. Because I forgot about President Millard Fillmore, who was one of the worst non-entities that the United States has ever produced. And God knows they produced a few. <laughs> anyway, when he won... He was so delighted. The lady who was in charge of them said he looked 10 years younger and he looked as if he'd scored the greatest victory since whenever, because he beat me. And then he said, well, what about the pharaohs of Egypt then? I said, Martin, don't jest with me, lad. I said, I only know the names of three or four of them. And one of them's Tutankhamun. Oh, he said, he's, no, he's not, he's not important, he's not significant. I said, oh, yeah. He said, right, he said, I can, I can go through all the 30 dynasties. And he did. And he, he went through them. 
3,000 years of them. Good and great. I just stood there thinking, how, how does he do that? And the girl who was looking after him said, you know what, Steve, he can't look after himself, you know. I said, I said, listen, I said, if he, if he knows all them, he doesn't have to look after himself. It was one of the most impressive displays I have ever seen in my life. Good grief. Yeah. Every one of them. And the names are not easy either, I can tell you. No. Nefertiti. Uh, yeah. He's one of the girls. Yeah. yeah. And, and, so... She now, was the first female, wasn't she? First yeah. female... Um, now I've told you all about that, I'm now going to tell you that I'm not going to talk about any of them. Good. Because the first one was 3000 BC. 5000 years ago. Exactly at the same time that something else began, which is not very far from here, which some of you might have visited, and which is one of the most extraordinary monuments in the world. Mm. Stonehenge on uh -huh. Salisbury Plain. Yes. Now, the difference between Egypt and Stonehenge is they could write about things and we couldn't. So, it's guesswork and summation, but to create the monument that I'm going to describe, they must have had a very high level of operation and society. And whilst it may not be as vast as the pyramids in its own way, it is a most extraordinary um, monument. So I'm going to try and describe that today. And I'm, there's been a few programs about it recently on the TV. And I've also got two books I bought when I was there about 15 years ago. And the stones, massive stones, 13 feet high, some of them, and they had holes in them, probably for wooden posts. And the guide encouraged me to put my hand into this hole. And I, I was scared of anything biting me. And all these little ones, they must have been about seven or eight. They were all laughing at Put your hand in, put your hand in, put your hand in. And, I, and they were all calling me a scaredy cat because I wouldn't. But in the end, I did. And as I say, some of those stones are four metres high, 13 feet in height. Is that why you've got all the bandages on your fingers on the... Uh... Yeah, that's right, because it bit me. So, uh, it's in Wiltshire, of course, five miles from a Avebury on uh, Salisbury Plain. The standing stones, as I said, were, were 13 feet high, or some of them. I'll go through them in a moment. The most famous, one of the most, the, probably the most famous site in England and one of the most famous in Europe. Um, the stones are seven feet wide and the majority of the standing stones weigh 25 tons. Mm. They had no wheels. Wheels were not yet invented. Well, certainly not here. They might have had in the Middle East, I'm not sure, but not here. There were and are hundreds of burial mounds in the area. At least a 3,000. And to some extent, in the early days, these were ignored. People were so excited about the stones themselves that they didn't take much interest in the burial mounds. But now, the amount of advancement in science means that we can take them far more seriously and they tell us a great deal about the lives of the people. Protected since 1882 and that was the start of the protection of English rural sites, protection of rural England and so on. And um, it needed protection as well because buildings were encroaching onto the area. But it's now essentially back to agricultural land. Um, the land is now owned by the Queen, by the Crown, or by the National Trust. 
In regards to the burial mounds, let me just say what's changed. Now, for instance, because of strontium, an element which is found within bones, it is now possible, for instance, to say where an animal bone came from. So, they found lots of pig bones, leg bones. Nice leg of pork, Charlie. How do you, are you all right yeah. with that? Yeah. And because of the strontium, they found that many of those bones had been brought from the north of England, from Scotland, to this site, which mm -hmm. presumes that it was a site which so many people venerated, that they were prepared to travel immense distances to get to it. Now, we are talking at a time when there are no roads. There can't be. There's no... Well before the M6. Nothing. There's nothing. Most... Salisbury Plain was wooded. Most things were. Where we live was almost foreign, forested right down to, say, Formby Shore, even so. So how people even travelled and how they even knew where they were going or what they were travelling to, it's hard to say. Whether there were small kingdoms or countries or villages, or towns, it's, it's even hard to say, but to create what they created, there must have been a word of mouth network of high proportions. What they built first were wooden structures, 3000 BC, 5000 years ago. Wooden structures which have decayed and gone. The only thing you find, if you've dug wood into the ground, um, even when the fence has gone, when the wood's gone, the holes that you dug into the ground to put the fence or the wooden posts in are there, and whatever is collected in those pits can also be examined. So what they built first was a ditch, and then the chalk that they took out of the ditch, outside that, they then built that into a circular bank. Again, about 3000 BC to about 2500 BC. Now, if you say, well, a bank and a ditch, it, it feels like you are creating a defensive wall. What you are defending people from or to, I'm not sure. There doesn't seem to appear to have been any fighting there, any military action there. And it seems to have been a site where all people were welcomed. Perhaps it was a site like the Olympic site in Greece where, while the games were on, all quarrels and fights between different nations were forgotten. Anyway, the bank was an enclosure with, uh, an in the, as I say, with the internal ditch. Now, the stones were above other stones. That is, they were perched, they were standing on them using joints. They were jointed and lintled so that the stones were not precariously but were balanced above the stones that were on the ground which took it to around some of it anyway to 16 meters in height that's about 50 feet now that is the stones after 2500 when they abandoned timber and started to use um started to make the stone monuments or hanging stones, as some of them were called. These burial sites were within this ditch. So what we are creating, essentially, is a wall and protected cemetery. These are all cremations. It is very interesting to think that in law in this country, cremation is quite a modern concept. But yet, at this time, there were no burials in Britain, by the sound of it, at all. Many of the people were cremated where they had lived and brought to this site for, their for the remains to be placed within mounds or pits. That, that really is fascinating. They can even tell us where those people lived from whence they came and where their remains were brought from. Some of them, as I said, from Scotland and a far, and a far distance. There seems to have been phases here. They did something, they built the bank, they built the ditch, then they stopped, 
Then they put the stones in. Then they put an outside ring of stones in to protect the ones that were internal. But there were gaps in between, sometimes of several hundred years. Why, I don't know. Maybe there was politics. Maybe there was disruption. Maybe there was disorder. We don't know. They have found evidence of people from 8000 BC in the posts where the in the pits where the main wooden posts were placed so the site appears to have been occupied well before any of the stones arrived the stones are also aligned on an east and west salient line now that means obviously the sun rises in the east and sets in the west and it mattered to them their whole life depended on the sun as it still does to us their grain their crops their whole survival we don't know whether this was a religion or whether it was a sun worship or whatever but certainly they needed the sun and the, it was very central to their lives it also appears from this site and the site in Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire, that there is a calendar involved. Now, how would they know, and this is another question, it's impossible to answer, the shortest day of the year? Now, obviously we do, we know when it is, we know how short it is. But how did they know, with no written language, no measure, as far as we know, no measure of time. They may have had sand glasses or things like that, but we don't know. And yet it appears, but this is controversial because some people don't agree with this bit. It appears that there is some evidence of calendar and, and their knowledge that they had about where the sun would actually strike a stone at a particular time on a particular day. Um, which still is what brings people to Stonehenge today, the winter solstice, etc. So that, that bit is a bit controversial, and it has also enabled people to invent some pretty far-out theories about Stonehenge, which I am going to avoid today. But there are plenty of bizarre suggestions. But no, I think this is just the people who lived in that area all those years ago. Now, as I said, the wooden structure fails and then the stone circles are added. Now, the blue stones, that's the next incredible part of our now, story. In 2011, a quarry was found where the stones were exactly the same as the ones that are used at Stonehenge. But there is one immense problem. They're 140 miles away in Pembrokeshire in West Wales. Now just think about that. Stones higher than almost two people, some of them weighing 20 tonnes or more. How do you do it? How do you get them there? Well, there are illustrations in books from China, India and Japan and what they do they put them on rollers and then somebody from the back takes the roller from the back if I get this wrong sir, and then put it underneath the front yeah. and then they roll it forward again yeah. and then someone does exactly the same it's a pretty high labour intensive job I bet, you, I bet there was no shortage of workers on this now that was one way of doing it imagine the journey they'd have to make the other method is by sea well before we get that far let's just think of two things we don't know what boats they had we don't know what ships they used from where they are you've got to go um, down the Bristol Channel along the north coast of Devon and Cornwall yeah Round Land's End, which is no easy feat for a modern sailor, never mind then. No, you don't have to go round Land's End. Yeah, you do, because you have to go along the south coast, don't you, to land them. 
No, so, so if you got these stones from Wales, took them down the Bristol Channel, yeah, you'd have to take them round Land's End to take them along the south no, coast to land them at Salisbury or Wiltshire or wherever. No, you wouldn't. No, you, the uh, if you were doing it by sea, if you were doing it by sea, you'd just come up the Bristol Channel and and land it round Gloucestershire. And then go yeah, in from, going land from there. Well, it's a further journey, but I suppose you've No, it's done not it. further, it's shorter. Well, all right. Sorry. So, sorry, I'm not too. Uh, no. I'm, I'm not undermining you. All I'm saying then, which I'll. So here you are, you see. Even me and Charlie, and I, I, he may be right, he probably is. But what I'm really then saying, and what, what I still think stands up, is that it was an immense job to bring these mighty oh. articles from where they were to where they needed to be. And it must have required the work of, well, I don't know about thousands. Um, but definitely but hundreds. Definitely hundreds. And, and, and imagine, that, as you were saying, that the whole of England in those days was forested. And there were about 50 of these stones. Yeah, yeah. So each one must have surely taken months or, well, several months to bring. Yeah, well, just chopping them out of the earth to start and, with. And, and then they kept bringing them. And why did they do it? Who, told, who, who decided that they were the stones they needed? Some people have suggested that, that the Ice Age brought them and deposited them on the plain, but there are no others in the area. Yes. So that, that theory's not got much support now. So these were brought one way or another um, by human Hand. And as and as I understand it, there's no evidence anywhere of them being ma um, manipulated or machined down, you know, or you yeah. know, chipped. There's no, no uh, axe chippings or anything like that anywhere. There's a couple of carvings on some of them, like not Kilroy was here, but you know, like yeah. boys particularly always want to put names into. And yeah. there's a couple of carvings of animals that they've found, and a few other things on them, yeah. probably done by ordinary workers. Right, so. They've now built this monument with these new blue stones. One of the other things about them is, and I noticed this when I was there, if you tapped them, they made a ringing sound, oh. almost musical. And there is a culture in several parts of the world called ringing rocks, where they would tap them to get different resonances, different notes. Now that really is that really is weird. I mean, there's all sorts of theories about that, but certainly they do make that noise because it was they were tapped to show me how how different it was. Whether they were brought for that reason or whether they were, were used for that reason, we can never know. Now, they have to give you an example. Dug 56 of these of pits. Now nobody knows why they. Why, why they dug these. Maybe they were for rubbish or to get it below ground. We don't know. But to give you an example, in 1924, there was an excavation and this guy dug up thousands of very small bone fragments. And what he did, he just buried them all in one of the pits which he dug it, which they excavated. Thinking, oh well, they're no use. But now they've all been examined. And some of the stories they tell are quite extraordinary. Workers, for instance, who have a DNA which meant that they were from the Mediterranean. Now, I've heard of people getting on their bikes and going for work. But imagine that sort of a journey at that time. Because somebody somewhere had told you that if you got to where you got to, there would be work in the construction industry. Because that's what it is. It's the biggest, one of the biggest construction jobs of ancient of the ancient world. So they found people in these pits. They found fragments of people from a great distance away. Many workers came from West Wales, where the where the uh, stones came from. Well, you can see that, can't you? They they would obviously go to where the work was, and they went with the stones. They may have been the ones who brought them and then stayed. There's a camp about two miles away from Stonehenge where they now reckon nearly all of the workers lived and they've done huge amounts of work on what they ate, how they lived, on their pottery and 
and why they came and how they lived. So this work is providing us these 50,000 bone fragments have provided us with a, an idea of the lives of the people who were there working. Remains of 63 individuals were found in these fragments and have been patiently pieced together. Men, women and children. So workers had their wives and families with them. They might have been on the site for 20 or 30 years. As say stonemasons would be today, at a cathedral for instance. Their whole lives might have been just involved in just this one site. Now, one grave has been found. One particular grave has been found outside the encampment. <clears throat> and it looks like a very important person. It's a grave. So, at some stage, around 2000 BC, they started burying people rather than cremating. Now, that must be either a decision made by a by a religious body or say somebody said for instance if there's an afterlife you can't you can't go there if you're cremated because you don't exist so say for instance you say oh well if there's an afterlife we bury people with all their worldly goods and whatever we've whatever they've got so that as in the egyptian fashion so that when they wherever they get to next they'll have all the things with them that they need that was the whole basis of, it, of the Egyptian civilization. So around 2000 BC, we started to get burials, and they found one very important one. And because of what he has with him, and because of what they found, and they were able to get DNA, imagine that, they know that that man came from what is now Switzerland. What is now Switzerland so he has come, for whatever reason, across Europe and across the Channel to get to Stonehenge. Can well, I just uh, jump in there? That's the most distant person that they've found up to now. Yeah, you, you were saying they found uh, remains of people from the Mediterranean. And maybe the Mediterranean meaning Egypt. And uh, maybe the, they started burying people when this guy from Egypt or the people from Egypt started saying well you can't go to heaven you know yeah I suppose if somebody suddenly turned up from somewhere like that and you didn't know where they'd become quite famous wouldn't they they might yeah. become something of a no, I say a god figure or a kind of mm. cargo culture figure and this fellow uh, apparently from from Switzerland he may have been a well well traveled person and but, and and uh, or maybe even a religious man who who started the uh, uh, the idea of being buried. Yeah. Um, the, mere, the mere idea of doing that, though, is, is, is I, yeah. I suppose... Very radical, isn't it? Why, why some people have... Why, why that has been mentioned, though, and it is significant, is the similarity of dates between the first Egyptian dynasty yeah. and the start of work on Stonehenge. Yeah. But the idea of the interchange of information at such an early date is fascinating. Mm -hmm. One thing's for certain, the more we know about the ancient world, the more we have to put dates backwards, and the more we find that we have underestimated our ancestors and what they did and what they were able um, to do. Some people have suggested that the blue stones were grave markers connected with the change from cremation to burial. But that theory um, has not been accepted by everybody. But there again, many of the things haven't been accepted by anybody, everybody, and there are still great controversies. Wooden stone being abandoned. And sometimes, as I said before, there are gaps of 400 or 500 years where nothing appears to happen. Or there are signs of decay, almost as if, the site has been left or ignored for a while. And they can tell that by for various um, archaeological um, finds and reasons, almost as if camps were deserted and so on. Around 2000 BC, there was another um, period of, of building. 
and some more stones were brought either from um, the Welsh quarry or another quarry about 50 miles north of Stonehenge. One stone that has been brought from that site has been identified and weighed 50, stone, 50 ton. It was called the altar stone. Now, <coughs> that Sorry. presumes a, a religious significance, and it must have had. You can't, it can't have attracted all these people from all this area without having some religious or mystical quality. One other theory suggested by two modern archaeologists is that it was a place of healing because they have found so many people there and they can tell by the skeletal remains who had deformities. But there again, I'm not sure about that because apparently from one other source I read, nearly everybody had bone or deformity problems at some point or other. So the, as it, whether it was a place where people brought people to be healed, that might be quite a modern Christian concept. We don't know. We really do not know what that... Um, what that what was the reason that brought people with with all that different distance but we do know because of these bones and because we know where these animals were killed and that they were killed where they lived and then brought is that people brought offerings now why did they bring offerings for religious or political reasons i'd have thought more likely religious than yeah. political because at that time it would have been very difficult for anybody to exercise power over a large area i can imagine people were in charge of small towns or settlements but the idea of wessex or mercia or northumbria and all those things surely it's far too early it must have been quite small individual relatively self-contained communities but something drew them something drew them to this site from distances which um, are pretty unimaginable in, um, in t uh, today when you think of the distance that they must have travelled. Now, there is an argument about how much mathematical knowledge was involved here. Not everybody agrees on that. And the people who do say about this, sometimes they want to stray into what you might call astronomical theories or even alien theories and there's the internet is packed with them packed with people saying that somebody arrived here and yeah. built it and then went all the usual nonsense but we don't need to worry about that if we talk about the sunrise and sunset we understand that because to them that must have been the most significant thing to get through a long cold winter and then to see some heat in the sun must have convinced them that they would be able to live for another year and survive for another year and that they would be able to plant crops and that those crops would be harvestable which meant that they could live for um, another year in that settlement. I've mentioned the as known as the Stonehenge Archer this is the Switzerland gentleman I told you about who was found with a bow and metal and bronze implements which, that, which denotes a person's imper uh, uh, importance. Now, um, no work was carried out at the monument after 1600 BC. It appears, that's 3,600 years ago, it appears that at that stage, for one reason or another, the monument was completely abandoned and no one appears by then to be living in, the, in that area. Um, it doesn't appear as though anything happened, fire, storm, uh, outside event, but it does appear, um, again, well, no, they can be absolutely certain about this, that no actual work took place after, as I say, about 1600 BC. The site was written about in modern history um, people came out with all sorts of theories even in the um, 13th century um, 
Geoffrey of, Monument came, of Monmouth came up with some very fanciful theories about the monument. In, 17, in the 17th century, it was examined for the first time by somebody with a bit of science. But of course, the way they examined things, digging up things in layers, putting everything in bags, every item identified and named, that wouldn't have happened. It would just be a kind of dig, basically. Let's dig a hole and see if we find anything. But it, that started in the 17th century. It was owned by landlords, basically. Um, I've got a full list of them. The Marquis of Queensbury, at one point, um, the founder of the Boxing Rules. And then an, a family called the Antrobus family from Cheshire. They owned it. They owned all the land in the area. And they sold out in 1924 to a man called yeah. Cecil Sharp. Now, um, these, uh, as I said, um, in 1924, Cecil Sharp bought the site for £6,600. Now, Sharp was the president of the English Folk Song and Dance Society. Oh. And with people like Vaughan Williams and Hulst and others, they would go around the country collecting... Um, songs, ordinary people, a fascinating character, just singing songs that they knew. Our folk tradition owes a great deal to Mr. Sharp. He also went to America with his girlfriend and did the same thing in the Appalachians as well, with the redoubtable Maud Carpenter. So he bought Stonehenge because he thought a local person should own it and that it should be saved. Three years after he bought it, he gave it to the nation. And then there was a national campaign in some of the newspapers to collect money to stop people building on the site. There was a house development at one point which got quite near to the site. But in the end, a newspaper, two newspapers I think, collected a vast amount of money and made people realise how important the site was by constantly reminding them that it was as old as the Egyptian pyramids and even, <coughs> as they said, more famous. Now, I told you about Geoffrey of Monmouth. Uh, just to give you an example, one of his theories was that Merlin built it, who was the wizard in King Arthur's legend. So, mm. there you go. It's always, a well, it's bound to. It's always attracted. It was always bound to have attracted all sorts of strange theories. Now, sometimes at the moment, on, for instance, the winter solstice or midsummer's day, 30,000 people will gather at the site. And if it's a quiet news day, there'll always be somebody from BBC or ITV at the end of the news. And they're pretty harmless. I mean, what's the word you might use? Hippies or whatever. I don't know how you, good luck, I don't know how you, how you describe them. But it does attract gloriously... Um, how shall I put it? Fascinating people who go there at very early do very early hours of the night to sing their little tunes. By the way, there is no evidence of Druid connection with this site. There's not much evidence of the so-called Druids anyway. There's one Roman historian who mentions them, but there's no real evidence that they ever really existed beyond the imagination of a segment of the public. So it's still a very popular site now. It's been modernised a lot with visitor centres and all the usual stuff. But you can understand why it attracts um, uh, so many visitors. Um, I just wanted to mention, just to give you an, a quick example, just in my last few minutes, another site from a similar date uh, is a village that um, was founded on the main island of Orkney. Now, this, to reach Orkney uh, nowadays is difficult. I asked Google this morning, and it was five trains and a couple of ferries, and it wasn't easy. So, um, this site 
uh, Scarabrae, as it's called, is on the main Orkney Island, which is mainland. It's a village where eight houses have been identified and absolutely, not rebuilt, because they were still there, but organised to a point where they know that this site was occupied from 3500 BC to 3100 BC and then it was abandoned. Now, the suggestions for abandoning that site have been climatic, that it got colder and that it got colder so people couldn't grow anything. There is cultivation in this site. They used to think that they were hunter-gatherers but one of the recent excavations found grain uh, that had been cultivated and it may well be that they abandoned Orkney to um, go back to the main land of Scotland but how they ever ended up on Orkney anyway when they could have lived on the mainland is is impossible to understand unless they were driven out by an opponent or an enemy mm. eight houses one uh, very interestingly, somebody who's written about this village says that they look as if they probably were extremely comfortable. One large family room with kind of stone or wooden furniture. Must have been a bit hard to sleep on, I would have thought. But it looks as though they were quite comfortable housed with barred doors. So you would have a door, and uh, a stone or wooden door, and then you would put a bar across it in, you know, it insets in the stone. And you'd put this bar across the door, which kept it closed and kept it snug. Because it was probably a bit cool up there sometimes. Mm. This site was abandoned. But I only mention that to tell you that at this time, Stonehenge, although it is the most important of them, it's not the only one. There are all sorts, of, in our country, all sorts of the most strange events and sights. Well, that white horse, well, that, that's in that area, isn't it, that you can well, there's see? There's a few all over yeah. England. Now, yeah. these, are, these are, um, have been there for eons, thousands of years. And so, although prehistory has been started, Brit British prehistory usually starts when the Romans first invaded in 55 BC. Um, they did not find some out-of-the-way little place with wild people running about in Wode. What they entered was a country in its own way already extremely well established with a structure and the level of society which had enabled them to build Scarabray in Orkney, Stonehenge in Wiltshire, um, the stones, we've got stones here, haven't we? And Sp Spaghetti Junction in Birmingham. Yeah, Calder Stones. <laughs> and also these massive horses, chalk horses, yeah. that have appeared in the British countryside. So um, when the Romans came, this already was a place of wide interest. Right, everyone, well, look, it's not a subject I've ever talked about before. <laughs> and it's not what, I, what I, I used to study, but I certainly did enjoy reading all of my uh, stuff to get to this um, place today, to get to this study today. So thanks very much. And thank Charlie for his kind involvement. And we'll be with you all in two weeks. Yes, bye-bye.
Ben, number 1875. Our technician doing clever stuff tonight is Liz. Lighting up time is 17.42 to 07.02. Now I've got you some travel information here if you're going in by car or bus. Russell Street in Liverpool 3 is closed until March the 8th, which causes great confusion. Upper Parliament Street, the Liverpool 8, there's a lane restriction until April the 26th. And I know because I go that way. It adds 10 or 15 minutes if you go in the rush hour. It adds 10 to 15 minutes to your journey. It's just chocker. Victoria Street, Liverpool, t uh, Liverpool 2. Again, lane restrictions. And they're on until September the 30th. And this will add time to your journeys if you travel through to work that way. East Prescott Road and Prescott Road have lane restrictions. But these are at off-peak times and they're until March the 15th. I go that way as well, but I haven't come across them yet. And the number 136 bus is diverted because of the closure of Great Howard Street. That's still carrying on. If you need any travel information, then do phone 0151 330 1000. That has both bus and train travel times. Anything, any information you need about things going on in the city, music, concerts, events in the parks and at the Albert Docks and the city centre and the waterfront, then go to liverpoolecho.co.uk forward slash what's on and there you'll find the dates and the times, the venues and the prices and there are also phone numbers which you may need if you, if you want enquiries. Tonight's readers in this order are me, Barbara, then Alice and then Sue. development on green bread should be assessed. 
Liberal Democrat councillor Richard Hunt, who was part of the campaign against the hard drug tax, said, whilst welcoming the announcement by the City Chief Executive that the hard drug section of Halberstone Park will not be building, I am extremely concerned that the Council are to appeal against the judge's decision. The Council has failed to tell us what the national implications are of the decision, and I strongly suspect that they have appealed the decision because they wish to develop on other parts of the Green Wedge. This is taken from the Liverpool Echo, Saturday, February the 23rd, entitled Workers at Hospital Plan Strike Over Unfair Pay. Liverpool hospital workers are set to strike over unfair rates of pay with some earning a meagre £7.83 an hour. More than 40 staff who work as cleaners, catering staff, porters and security officers at Liverpool Women's Hospital plan to walk out because of private company OCS's refusal to pay them the NHS rate for the job. The lowest agreed pay rate for a worker in the NHS is £8.93 an hour. But OCS staff are paid considerably less than this, with some only receiving the minimum legal hourly wage rate of £7.83. Staff are losing out by up to 2150 this year alone. Other staff doing the same jobs as other hospitals are being paid the correct nationally agreed pay rates for NHS workers. In the formal ballot organised by the Union Unison, 100% of staff voted in favour of taking strike action. Stephanie Mahoney works as a domestic at Liverpool Women's Hospital and is paid the minimum wage of £7.83 per hour. She said, it's a real struggle to cope on the wage that I'm on. I'm a single parent and I need to keep a roof over my son's head. Gas and food bills keep going up for everyone, but it's harder for us to make ends meet. I sometimes work alongside colleagues who are paid £9 an hour, but we're doing the same work. Colleagues are very supportive of us taking action to get this sorted out, because they don't think it's right that we're on lower pay than them. I've never been on strike before, but I can't see how else this is ever going to change. We're all sticking together. Maria Moss, Unison's Northwest Regional Organiser, said, OCS is a profitable global business and they should pay all their staff at Liverpool Women's Hospital the NHS rate for the job. All OCS staff are performing important roles that affect the quality of care and the patient's experience of the hospital. All the staff are part of the NHS team and they should all be paid the agreed NHS rate. We raised this matter with OCS seven months ago and there's been no progress in getting resolved. OCS staff are very determined that they should be treated fairly and, equally, and equitably and their colleagues are supporting them in taking action. The strike will begin at 7am on Monday the 25th of February with picket lines outside Liverpool Women's Hospital all day. The ECHO has approached OCS for comment. This is from the ECHO on Friday February the 22nd. We're going to need a bigger vote. Sharks have become the latest group to be impacted by the UK's impending departure from the European Union. As the UK struggles to agree on a way forward and the possibility of a calamitous no-deal edge is cl closer, many businesses in our region are fearful about the future. And one of those is the popular Blue Planet Aquarium at Cheshire, Cheshire Oaks, Ellesmere Port. The aquarium is having to take action to make sure that its sharks are not affected by the fallout of a no-deal Brexit on the 29th of March. The centre's 3.8 million litre shark tank, I hope that doesn't break, relies on a salting process that takes place on site at the aquarium. Currently, all of the salt used in the processing is imported from France because it's the best quality and meets the centre's requirements. The spokesman explained where the problem lies, he said. We take delivery of this salt every three months. However, with the uncertainty surrounding Brexit, we've hired a facility to store salt with an extra order as there's no guarantee of delivery being on time after Brexit. Indeed, we have had to hire a haulier from Romania to drive to France as there are so many lorries now unavailable due to stockpiling of all sorts of goods prior to Brexit. He added, we've had to take these measures to ensure the safety of our marine life and the sharks. 
There are just five weeks to go until the UK leaves the European Union. Prime Minister Theresa May is still struggling to get the support she needs in Parliament for her exit deal, meaning the possibility of a chaotic no-deal departure is growing. This is an article from the Echo of Monday the 26th of February. There's nowhere quite like Aintree. Aintree Racecourse today reveals Scouse Bollywood star Amy Jackson as the 2019 of 2019 Randox Health Grand National Ladies Day Ambassador. The international star who grew up in Walton is now a major movie and TV actress and also a model. But this, despite all her success, she is still very much a Liverpool girl at heart. Speaking to the Echo ahead of today's announcement, Amy, 27, praised the city and the racing event. She said, I'm very excited for Aintree this year. I'm going to the races when I, I've been going to the races since when I was around 15 to 16 years old with my school friends. It was always our annual day out. We always spend months planning our outfits. So I'm really honored to be this Ladies Day ambassador. It's nice to be asked. The former Miss Liverpool shot to fame as one of Bollywood's biggest stars after being noticed by talent scouts at the age of 16. Amy recently announced her engagement to multi-millionaire and desperate scouse wives boyfriend, George Papayutu, who proposed while the couple were on holiday in Africa. She continued, I always watch the Grand National, no matter where I am in the world. In previous years, I've been in India and Canada. And it's funny because when I, was on the break on set and said I'm going to watch the Grand National. Everyone always knew about it, even in Canada. Liverpool is famous for its people. You don't get that anywhere else in the world. It's one of a kind. I can't wait to go back. I've been to races all over the world, Dubai and Abu Dhabi, but nothing is like Aintree. This year's Aintree Grand National Festival takes place from Thursday April the 4th to Saturday, April the 6th. Away from acting, Amy's second love has always been horses, as having been a competitive rider in her childhood. Amy added, I used to ride horses when I was younger and went on to compete professionally, so there's another reason I love entry. This next article is taken from the Liverpool Echo from Monday the 25th of February. It's entitled, Biggest Ever Rescue Bid to Save Walkers. The Coast Guard rescued 27 walkers and two dogs trapped by the sea in West Kirby on Saturday. The group were caught out after walking in an area while completely unaware of the incoming tide in what is described as the largest ever rescue by West Kirby Lifeboat Station. The Lifeboat and Coast Guard Rescue Officers launched from the south side of West Kirby Marine Lake after the drama on Sunday the 24th of Feb and made multiple trips to Little Eye, Middle Eye and Hilbury Island. A recovery and casualty care point was established at D Lane Car Park to cater for the large number of people, some of whom had, whom had entered in the water and were extremely cold and wet. In total, the lifeboat rescued 18 adults, 9 children and 2 dogs. They were taken to D Lane Car Park where they were met by Coast Guard rescue officers and lifeboat shore queue to be passed over to paramedics if necessary. Victims were checked over by the North West Ambulance Service, although none required hospital treatment. A, straight, a statement from Wirral Coast Guard said, West Kirby lifeboat, lifeboat, crow, sorry, lifeboat Crew, Coast Guard Rescue Officers and Paramedics worked exceptionally well together at this incident and undoubtedly prevented serious injury. Given the nature of the incident, a debrief was held at West Kirby Lifeboat Station. Today's tide was extremely high and cut off all three islands and completely covered the walkway around the marine lake. We would urge members of the public who are going for a walk to the islands or are going to the coast to check on the tide times before they set off. 
If you see someone in trouble, dial 999 and ask for the Coast Guard.